Hey everybody and welcome back to James Bond Revisited and now I have the sad duty to close out my beloved Roger Moore era with his final entry into the series of You to a Kill. Now, Roger Moore was famously ready to leave the James Bond franchise after For Your Eyes Only, but he was enticed to come back for the follow-up Octopussy because it was going up against Sean Connery's Never Say Never Again at the box office and audiences worldwide actually preferred Octopussy to Never Say Never Again, with it making significantly more money at the box office. So clearly audiences still loved Roger Moore in the role. So, as a result, Eon Pictures enticed him back for yet another James Bond movie, although he was now 58 years old, and would be doubled heavily throughout a movie that many James Bond fans think he was just too old to ever do. When we look back at Roger Moore as James Bond, I think people's ageism does come out a little bit. People always say that he was too old to play James Bond. I don't think he was too old to play James Bond. I think the problem with Roger Moore as James Bond was that he was playing James Bond as ostensibly a guy in his 30s. If they had acknowledged Roger Moore's age more, like they did in For Your Eyes Only, I think people would have had a much easier time accepting him as the role went on. The problem with A View to a Kill is that he's paired up with Tanya Roberts, who's about 30 years younger than him. Roger Moore in his biography, which appropriately is titled My Wood is My Bond, actually said that he was older than Tanya Roberts' mother when he was making this movie, and that's what told him he had to leave the part. Now, looking at this movie, it's clear that Roger Moore, before he did View to a Kill, might have been worried about his age and elected to have a little bit of plastic surgery. He may have denied this over the years, but if you look around his eyes, clearly something's been done and his mole is gone. The famous Roger Moore mole has been removed. I love that mole. I mean, that mole is what made James Bond for me. Mole. Anyway. Getting back to A View to a Kill, it is a movie that I think people have kind of come around to over the years. It was widely mocked when it came out, but there's something of a cult around it. In fact, it was recently celebrated on How Did This Get Made, and, you know, my own fiancé says that it's probably her favorite James Bond film, just because it's so silly and so much fun to watch. I got to see it in 4K at a Cineplex flashback screening some years ago, before, you know, the world shut down and movie theaters were still a thing, and A View to a Kill really does hold up. It's a lot of fun. Now, in this one, James Bond goes up against a Silicon Valley microchip magnet named Max Zorin, played by none other than Christopher Walken, with ties to the KGB. Now, as much as I loved Octopussy, I'll be the first to admit that Moore really probably should have left the series after wrapping that film. I think it would have been an excellent swan song and would have sent him out on a high note. In the DVD commentary of this, Roger Moore acknowledges over and over again that he should have sat this one out, and he's always said that it's his least favorite James Bond movie. And it's almost unintentionally funny watching Roger Moore in the film, as he kind of comes across as a little bit lecherous. Again, a problem with the fact that his leading lady is something like 30 years younger than him. He's not as suave as he was in previous installments. Also, it has to be said, Roger Moore is doubled a lot in this movie. Like, a lot. I think he might have just shown up to do his close-ups, otherwise he's barely in the film. The beginning of the movie where he's skiing in Siberia, I mean... I don't think Roger Moore was ever on location. He's got a close-up that they throw him in, and then when he gets on the iceberg boat to seduce the girl who's like 20, yeah, it's Roger Moore because, you know, he'll do those scenes. But the ski chase, yeah, I don't think there's much Roger Moore there except for a couple of grunts that they dubbed into the soundtrack where he goes, ooh, and ah, in the classic Roger Moore way. That said, Roger Moore is really not the only problem with A View to a Kill. It's never going to be remembered as one of the better entries in the series, and I think the fact is it's kind of an unimaginative outing. The filmmakers, I think, were trying to recapture the magic of Goldfinger in this film, but what they did is they replaced gold with microchips. Now, that's kind of forward-thinking, I guess, because, you know, computers and Silicon Valley be did become a big thing, and at the time it was kind of cutting edge, but, I mean, it's fairly silly and second-rate at times. There are some good action scenes, including a parachute jump off the Eiffel Tower, but otherwise, I don't think it really holds up as the most dynamic James Bond movie, although it's certainly a lot of fun, and it has a great soundtrack. So let's get into this movie a little bit. Everything that's wrong with Roger Moore in this film, as I said before, can be summed up by the opening teaser, where we get this really amazing action sequence, which is probably the best in the film, 
but we barely see Roger Moore's face because he was doubled for almost the entire thing. What's worse is when they finally do reveal his face and he's hitting on the girl that looks like she could be his granddaughter, she doesn't seem attracted to him, which is crazy for a Bond movie. I mean, he's James Bond. He's hot. Now, for Bond to work as a lady killer, he has to be believably attracted to women, and I think that Roger Moore at this point was just a little bit too old. They should have made the women in these films a little bit older, and I think it would have gone over a lot better. He just didn't come off in this one as an action star or a ladies' man, and he feels kind of ancient in the role. Which is funny, because if you look at him 10 years later, actually 12 years later, in The Quest, he looks a lot more fit, and he looks a lot more into the action, even opposite somebody like Jean-Claude Van Damme, who's over 30 years younger than him. I think, at this point, Roger Moore was just kind of getting tired of the part. And it's a real shame this was his last James Bond movie because he deserved to go out on a higher note, and I think that Octopussy, as much as some people have problems with it, would have fit the bill perfectly. Now, the screenplay in this one, as I said before, is lazy, so it gets kind of a 5 on 10. It's a lot of Michael G. Wilson's writing involved with Richard Maybaum, and it's not one of their best outings. The villains! This is a controversial one. Now, people love Christopher Walken, I love Christopher Walken, but... When Christopher Walken did A View to a Kill, he wasn't quote-unquote Christopher Walken, or at least not the scenery-showing Christopher Walken that we know nowadays. I believe that that Christopher Walken was born when he did King of New York. In this one, he's just kind of, you know, along for the ride. He's fine, but I don't think that he's one of the classic James Bond villains, although he's got fantastic hair in this movie. I mean, the movie is all about his hair. Walken does his best to make the character work and seems amused by Roger Moore and also has a psychotic edge, which is pretty good. Although Roger Moore himself took issue with a scene where Zorin's just mowing down all of his employees in a mineshaft saying that it was probably the most violent scene in a James Bond movie up to that point and he thought it was overkill. It's funny because I kind of love to see Walken come back and play a James Bond villain again. For him, I give him about a 7 on 10. Wow, what a view. But my favorite villain in the movie is definitely Grace Jones as Mayday, his henchwoman. Now, as much as Christopher Walken is kind of, I don't know if I'd say he's necessarily phoning it in, but seems, you know, not super engaged, Grace Jones is having the time of her life, is delighting being the bad girl, and is really physically fit. I mean, when you see her go up against Roger Moore, I really think that, you know, Grace Jones could have kicked his ass. I mean, she was chiseled in this movie and really brings a lot of menace to the part. But then at the end, when Mayday actually kind of becomes good, she brings a lot of pathos to the part, especially when she sees Alison Doty's Jenny Flex lying dead in a pool of water. She has this agonized cream of Jenny that I think actually really works. She really does care about these people. And I think the problem with Mayday is she was always a misfit and felt that Zorin was her family. And when he betrays her, her hurt is palpable, so that makes her transition to being a Bond ally at the end of the movie quite powerful. It's weird, when I was younger, I used to not like her so much in the part because I thought she was too much, but now I think she really kind of saves the movie. I love Grace Jones in this, and you should check out some of her music. Grace Jones really rocks. I'd give her a 10 on 10. Now the Bond girls, the late Tanya Roberts is absolutely beautiful, but they do not do much with her in this movie, I have to say. Her Stacey Sutton is pretty bland. She's a beautiful woman, but it's a nothing role. And the filmmakers don't even really give her a chance to be sexy as she wears all these big boxy 80s style blouses with big shoulder pads. In fact, when I said earlier that Roger Moore said that her mother was younger than him, in fact, she was only 45 years old, which was the age that Roger Moore was when he started playing James Bond in Live and Let Die. I mean, yeah, I could see why that would maybe put a chip on his shoulder. So for Bond Girls, I give her a 6 on 10, although I really don't think this is Tanya Roberts' fault. She's beautiful. If you really want to see her at her best, check out The Beastmaster, check out Sheena, or check out that 70s show. She's great. Now, Bond music. Now we're talking. John Barry is back to provide a memorable James Bond score, and he gives it kind of an 80s new wave sound, which surprisingly doesn't sound dated at all. I think that Barry was really good to jumping onto these cutting edge trends. And I have to say, the theme song by Duran Duran is one of the best of the whole series. I like the soundtrack a lot, I'd give it a 10 on 10. In fact, I sometimes listen to it on Spotify, just cause it's kinda kick ass. The body count. Funny enough, Bond actually only kills two people in this movie, but it's still one of the more violent James Bond movies because Watkins Zorin is psychotic and not only mows down his employees, but also has a couple of scenes where he murders people in really grotesque ways. Like this one part where he puts a spy down an engine and he just gets shredded by a propeller. I remember thinking that was pretty hardcore when I was a kid, and yeah, it's still pretty hardcore nowadays. Now, Bond sleeps with a lot of women in this movie, and if James Bond was a little bit over the hill, he was still taking his Viagra because, you know, that's, that's four women in this movie. It's pretty good. Not bad for Roger Moore. In some ways, I think his best chemistry is with Fiona Fullerton, who plays Pola Ivanola. 
a KGB agent who actually really seems turned on by Roger Moore, so I feel like she should have been the leading lady in this movie. Now, there's not a ton of great one-liners in this movie, but Christopher Walken gets off a good one when he drops a tycoon out of a blimp and says, so, anyone else want to drop out? There is, however, a really gross double entendre where James Bond has a meeting with Max Zorin just after having slept with Mayday, and Zorin asks him, you slept well? And Bond says, a little restless, but I got off eventually. I think we all know what he's talking about, right? And it's kinda gross. Now, there are some terrible gadgets in this movie. There are some x-ray glasses that Roger Moore wears at one point that are the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. I mean, if he's trying to be undercover at a party and he's got these massive lenses that he has to adjust and hold into place, eh, it's not really working. There's also like a Rocky IV style robot that Q is using at the end to spy on James Bond uh, while he's having sex with Stacey Sutton in the shower and it's a little bit weird and I think Q seems to be a bit of a peeper, right? Now, this isn't one of the better James Bond films, but it actually did pretty well at the box office. It made about $49 million in the US and $152 million worldwide, but significantly, it was about $30 million less than Octopussy when you consider worldwide sales. So they did decide at this point that they were gonna recast the part and I really think it was time. Roger Moore, as good as he was as James Bond, and I really do think that he was amazing as James Bond, and he's probably my nostalgic favorite, really needed to step down at this point, and they made the right choice. They opened the door for a whole new era in James Bond movies, which we're gonna get into on our next installment, but it wasn't as easy a transition as some may have thought. Until next time, this is A View to a Kill, which gets about a 006 on 10. I like this movie, I don't hate it like other people do, but I must admit it's not one of the best James Bond movies ever. See you next time with The Living Daylights. Mole.